Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Dr. Ingalls is a licensed naturopathic doctor with 30 years experience in the healthcare field. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Medical Technology from Purdue University and his Doctorate of Naturopathic Medicine from Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington. Prior to attending medical school, Dr. Ingalls worked as a clinical microbiologist and immunologist at Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. He's a fellow with the, both the American Academy of Environmental Medicine and the Medical Academy of Pediatric Special Needs. Dr. Ingalls is the author of The Lyme Solution, a five-part plan to fight the inflammatory autoimmune response and beat Lyme disease, which covers an integrative natural approach to the treatment and management of Lyme disease. He overcame his own three-year battle with Lyme disease and applied the same principles to now more than 6,000 Lyme and co-infection patients over the past 20 years, utilizing a naturopathic approach and therapeutic lifestyle to help each person overcome their illness. Dr. Ingalls has been featured on numerous podcasts, articles, and docuseries as one of the leading experts in Lyme disease, and I think you'll see why very soon. Dr. Ingalls' practice focuses on environmental medicine with special emphasis on Lyme disease and co-infections and chronic immune dysfunction. His practice is comprised of both children and adults where he uses diet, nutrients, herbs, homeopathy, and immunotherapy to help his patients achieve better health. It is with much admiration and great anticipation that I introduce to you Dr. Darren Ingalls. Welcome. Oh, thanks, Allie. Thanks for having me. Oh, this is such an honor for me. I I can't tell you how many times that I have personally, I I, I keep her book right by my bed side, <laughs> and it's it's sort of like I I affectionately refer to it as the Lyme Bible because I feel like no matter what question I have, I can flip through here, and and find you know, wherever it is in my um, journey to wellness, I can find some answers. Oh, that's great. Well, you know, that was certainly the intention of writing the book. I just came across so many people that, you know, they were getting dismissed by their conventional doctor, you know, they didn't believe they had Lyme disease, and people were just really kind of left at their own device to figure out how to navigate this Lyme world. And particularly if you live in an area where Lyme isn't considered endemic, you know, so many doctors and other healthcare practitioners really just aren't educated about Lyme disease. So I really wanted to have that guide that could really just kind of handhold you through the process, walk through you step by step on, you know, how to heal your gut, change your diet and do all these things and really empower you to take hold of your own health and not rely necessarily on the healthcare provider to do it for you. So I'm glad you found value in the book. (laughs) I I am too. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what led, you say that you battled your own battle with Lyme disease. Can you tell us was obviously that was maybe after you became a doctor or what was your path? Yeah. So I finished uh, medical school in 1999 and then finished my residency in 2000. And at the end of 2000, I moved to Connecticut to work uh, at a practice there. And I was at that practice for about 15 months and things weren't going so well. I decided to branch out and open my own practice. So in the process of getting ready to open my own practice about two to three weeks prior to me actually opening my doors, I uh, started feeling very unwell. I had 105 fever and headache and joint pain. I felt like my back was broken. I had numbness and tingling in my hands and feet. And I had meningitis when I was in college. So I thought, oh, I got meningitis again. I was actually getting ready to go to the hospital. And someone actually noticed I had a big bullseye rash on the back of my left leg. Of course, it was behind me. I couldn't see it. So after doing the double mirror thing and looking at the rash, I'm like, okay, well, I know what this is. I don't have to go to the hospital. So went to the urgent care center and was prescribed doxycycline, you know, the standard treatment. And really four days into doxycycline, I felt great. All my symptoms had resolved. And I figured, okay, I finished up my 21-day course as recommended. And I was fine. 
but you know, I literally just opened my own practice. And for anyone who owns their own business knows what's like when you open. I mean, I pretty much did everything. So I was the doctor and the keeper and the receptionist. And, and so I was working, you know, five, six, seven days a week, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And eight months into that schedule, I started to notice I was getting neuropathy again. I was getting back pain again. My headaches were coming back. And, you know, this, at this point, it's February in Connecticut. It's cold outside. I knew it wasn't a new tick bite because I hadn't been outside at all. And uh, I realized it was a relapse. So I said, okay, well, I went on doxycycle before. I'll go back on doxy again. And I went on for a month of doxy and nothing changed. And then I went on a month of azithromycin and nothing changed. And then I started working with a local Lyme doctor that put me on the, the rotation of different combinations of antibiotics. And eight or nine months into that, I just got worse. I had lost 25, 30 pounds. My gut was a wreck. I couldn't eat. I just felt miserable. And I was fortunate to have known of a doctor in New York City named Dr. Zhang. He's a Chinese medical doctor and acupuncturist. And I had seen patients being very close to New York City who had seen him over the years that were very successful in treating their Lyme disease with him. So I figured, hey, I got nothing to lose. I went and saw him. And three, four weeks into taking Chinese herbs and getting acupuncture, I was 80, 85% improved. So it was really my wake up call as a naturopathic doctor that I had to get back to my own roots and really take better care of myself, get better sleep, eat better, you know, all the things I kind of ignored in getting my business off the ground. I just had to take stock of that and start, you know, doing that in my own life. And even after then, I mean, I felt better like pretty quickly, but it still took me another two years of, you know, doing various therapies and ultimately like it was homeopathy that got me over the final hurdle where I eventually got to the point where I was 100% you know, symptom free. And so, do you do you think that any one of those multitude of treatments that and protocols that you used would have been, you know, any one of them would have been the one hit wonder? Or do you think it was just a, because you tried a, a lot of different things? Well, the herbs definitely made the biggest impact the quickest. You know, when I started on his herbal formula, as I said, within three to four weeks, I already felt 80, 85 percent better. So that had a big impact quickly. But, you know, I think if I had just done that and didn't change anything else in my life, I probably would have hit a, you know, a plateau. And I think, you know, we see this a lot with Lyme people where, you know, they introduce a therapy, there's some element improvement, but then it just kind of stagnates and whatever they got is what they got. And so, you know, again, in my training as an naturopathic doctor, you know, we look at the whole person. Again, I had to realize that, you know, it was my sleep pattern, going to bed late, waking up early, not sleeping very well. And of course, when you sleep, that's when your body, you know, heals itself, detoxifies. I hadn't been eating as well as I normally did. And just the stress, you know, and stress is those one thing that really seems to undermine anybody with a chronic illness, particularly Lyme disease. So it was all those environmental factors, lifestyle factors, diet factors, in combination with the herbs. And then again, I did acupuncture, I did homeopathy, I did cranial sacral therapy. So I did do a lot of other complementary therapies. And I think, again, they all helped to a certain degree. But ultimately, it was really about fixing me versus just treating Lyme disease. It was really getting my terrain healthier and less hospitable to the organism. And you know, once I went through my own process, I really just started applying what I learned about myself to my patients. And I found, wow, you know, before, again, I think the focus was more on just kill the bug. And I realized it's not just about killing the bug. And of course, when you look at the research, realizing that Lyme triggers really more of this autoimmune process. You know, when I started thinking of Lyme as an autoimmune disease, as much as an infection, you know, it really shifted the way I started thinking about Lyme patients. And again, applying these principles, I just was getting much better results than I was before when I was really focusing on just killing the bug. Excellent. I love that. Um, I, found, I found the same thing. What, now, I know you see a lot of children in your practice. Have you ever had children come in with the diagnosis of autism and you were able to realign that diagnosis with your treatment? Well, I work with a lot of kids with autism, and I actually started that very early in my medical career, even before I really started treating a lot of Lyme disease. I was already working with a lot of children on the spectrum. And it's interesting, I have a couple of colleagues uh, who have very similar practices to myself, where we see a lot of Lyme patients and children with autism. And we agree that we find about 30% of the kids we see with autism have, uh, they test positive for Lyme disease. And when we wow. treat them, a lot of their symptoms that got attributed to being autism actually are related to Lyme. Now, I've never seen a child when we treat them for Lyme disease, their autism goes away 100%. But 
you know, these kids that walk on their toes, a lot of the behavior issues, sometimes the gut issues, the language, the cognition, a lot of times we'll see improvement when we implement Lyme treatment. So we know it's a contributing factor. And, you know, both Lyme disease and autism have this element of neural inflammation, right? That there's something that's inflaming the brain. And depending on what part of the brain's affected, that's, you know, what we see clinically. So as we take that load off their body and we deal with the infection part and or the autoimmune part that Lyme's triggering, get the brain quieter, you know, then we see clinical improvement in kids on the spectrum. It's amazing. I bet you've helped a lot of children that way. Um, I want to go and sort of branch off into a, a sort of a random question, but would you consider infertility a chronic illness? Uh, well, potentially. I mean, I, I guess I don't know if I would say illness just because a lot of, you know, uh, particularly women with infertility don't feel necessarily infertility. So it's not something that disrupts their daily life, but it is certainly a chronic problem. And, you know, infertility can be tied into so many different things, you know, in particular with Lyme disease. You know, I think one of the more common things I've seen in, with women with you know, persistent infertility issues are particularly these women that have endometriosis. And endometriosis is an extremely common problem. One in seven women in the United States have endometriosis. Many do not know they have it, but Clinically, you know, because typically when you first start menstruating, you get, you know, painful periods, heavy bleeding, a lot of clots, and often that starts from, you know, the first time a woman starts menstruating. So women with endometriosis have this disposition that when they get exposed to Lyme disease, it's like throwing gas on the fire. It just makes everything a lot worse, including some of the fertility issues. You know, a lot of women with endometriosis will have fertility issues because of how the endometrial lesions are impacting the ovaries and the egg quality but there's that secondary part that involves Lyme disease. And I've seen that as part of the problem in a lot of women. Wow. Uh, and then sort of piggybacking on that theme, how, what, what part, what, let me just start this over because I'll get this in editing. <laughs> so piggybacking on that theme, to what extent does Lyme disease affect hormones for men and women? Well, I think it's huge. And we actually have a lot of literature showing that Lyme can disrupt a lot of hormone pathways. I would say thyroid is the most common. And we've got evidence that Lyme often induces hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid. But because your hormones are all connected, you know, the thyroid can then affect your adrenal function, which in turn can affect, you know, reproductive hormones, including estrogen, progesterone or testosterone. So, you know, for women, again, who are having menstrual Ill irregularities, men that have low testosterone, even young men, if they've been exposed to Lyme disease, there is that potential of how it you know, interferes with the brain, the pineal gland in particular, and that ultimately affects a lot of these downstream hormones. So I would say in my practice, you know, up to 40, 50% of people with Lyme disease will have some element of hormone disruption. And again, thyroid's the most common, adrenal dysfunction is probably the second, and then the reproductive hormones are probably third, and what I see in my practice. And are the treatments for each of those similar? Well, they're different because the hormone pathways are a little bit different, even though all the hormones talk to each other and they're connected. So, you know, the way I think about Lyme disease is, you know, if you're standing on the lake in the morning and it's a nice quiet lake and a motorboat goes blowing by, the boat can be long gone, but the waves are still rippling in the wake. And Lyme's kind of the same thing, is that Lyme kind of creates this, this you know, path of destruction in your body that even if you're successful at eradicating the organism, you still have to clean up the mess. And you know, this endocrine or hormone disruption secondary to Lyme is a common mess that we have to clean up. So even if we're doing active Lyme treatment, we get the bug under control. You know, once that hormone has shifted, often we have to intervene at some level to get those hormones functioning the way they should again. So, you know, whether we're giving, you know, some sort of thyroid support or adrenal support or trying to balance estrogen and progesterone or, you know, raising testosterone levels, you know, the interventions are going to change really depending on what hormone pathway we're trying to correct. But, you know, in my world, looking at all the hormones together is important because we really want to see, again, how they are all talking to each other. And even though, you know, we might identify initially that there's a thyroid issue, you know, it's always important, at least for me, to double check, is there an adrenal issue? Are the reproductive hormones working the way they should? Because again, there can be that trickle down effect that once you start getting dysfunction in one, it can really affect the other. So it's just uh, smart to, you know, check everything else and make sure that they're all functioning the way we want them to. Sure, sure. 
And now being that Lyme is the fastest growing vector borne infectious disease in the US, and people get so frustrated by this. Why is it Me so too. difficult? To, <laughs> why is it so difficult to to test, and why is it so difficult to detect? Well, what makes Lyme extremely difficult to detect is that we don't have a good measurement to look at Lyme directly in the body. We rely on the immune response to the organism. So, you know, in 40 plus years of you know understanding Lyme disease we have never changed the criteria of diagnosing Lyme. You know, first and foremost, you know, people need to understand Lyme is a clinical diagnosis. And what that means is based on your signs and your symptoms. So the lab tests that are out there are really just to confirm your suspicion. And if you go to the CDC's website, don't, don't take my word for it, go to the <laughs> CDC's website, look at Lyme disease, and under diagnosis, the first line it says, based on signs and symptoms, and number two is, do you live in an area endemic with deer ticks? And then they say laboratory tests basically are there to help confirm, you know, the diagnosis of Lyme. But the diagnosis itself is really clinical. And the problem with that is that a lot of doctors are taught that the way you diagnose Lyme disease is from a blood test. And that's never been true. And again, I was a microbiologist before I was a doctor. I used to do Lyme testing for a living. So, you know, the nature of this test is it's an antibody test. And antibodies are the immune response to exposure. So at best, you know, this test would be ideal for someone who was acutely exposed to Lyme disease. And we know so many people out there, their exposure could have been months to years prior to the onset of symptoms. So if you don't catch people in that relatively short window of acute exposure, the likelihood of picking up those antibodies starts to wane. We know that immunity naturally wanes with time. So the further you get away from your initial exposure, the less likely you are to pick up those antibodies. And because they're antibodies, that's also dependent on your natural immune response to any kind of foreign you know, substance, whether it's a virus or bacteria. So if you have any element of immune deficiency, if you're on a medication that suppresses your immune system, you know, there's any number of other environmental factors that influence the immune response. Basically, if your immune system doesn't function the way it should, it doesn't recognize Lyme as being foreign, you may not make enough antibody to make that test turn up positive. So you know, we had a lab very briefly that was doing a culture uh, they got shut down by the FDA, so we don't have any current lab that's measuring Lyme directly in the body. And even if we did, we don't know where the best place is to collect the sample to send to that lab. Is it in the blood? Is it in tissue? And the reality is, is that it probably isn't in blood as much as we think. It probably gets into tissue because we know that Lyme can invade really any organ, any cell. So, you know, without knowing the right sample to send anyway, even if that lab existed, which it doesn't, you know, we're still heavily dependent on looking at the immune response to Lyme. And because of, again, all these variabilities on how people's immune response uh, reacts, you know, what often happens is, you know, you've got these collection of symptoms, you go to your doctor, you get the standard, you know, blood test through a reference lab, and the reference lab just says, okay, well, you know, you've got these positive antibodies, and, you know, therefore you do or do not have Lyme. But again, because they're measuring the quantity of antibody, and you know, just to kind of go down this rabbit hole a little bit deeper so people really understand what this test is measuring, you know, it's measuring a series of antibodies. So the CDC criteria is you do a two-tier testing. The first one is a screening test, looks at IgG and IgM antibodies. So IgM antibodies are the antibodies we associate with acute infection, and IgG is the antibody we associate with more long-term or chronic infection. So it measures both. And if your test is positive, then it flexes over to what we call a Western plot. And a Western blot is a more specific test that measures a whole bunch of different antibodies. Also, again, IgG and IgM. Well, the CDC criteria is that you have to have two out of three IgM antibodies or five out of 10 IgG antibodies to call that test positive. But within each antibody, they measure you against a control. And when they measure it, there's an intensity level that they're measuring. And to be called each individual antibody to be called positive, it has to be at least 60% of the intensity of the control. And with most lab tests that are out there, when you run controls, you will run a low, a medium, and a high, representing that there's a range of what's normal and potentially abnormal. Well, they don't do that in a Western blot. It's just basically a high control. So basically, they set the bar, the bar very high that if you have Lyme, the expectation is you make a lot of antibody. But again, what if you don't make a lot of antibodies? <laughs> and again, in 40 years of research, we've learned that some of these antibodies are very specific to Lyme and some of them are not. So why we've never changed that criteria to really focus in on the Lyme-specific antibodies and maybe ignore the ones that aren't specific, you know, 
I can't explain why it doesn't make any sense, but you know, one of the labs I work with, they actually send me a copy of the Western blot and I can see those percentages. And I've seen people come back where some of these Lyme specific antibodies are 59%, 58%. Well, that one, 2% difference, I mean, that's just a function of your blood volume. If you were more dehydrated, less dehydrated, that's the difference between you do or do not have Lyme disease. So, you know, again, when you look at these antibodies that are Lyme specific, you know, in my world, you know, even having one Lyme specific antibody, I think is significant, particularly if you've got clinical symptoms to support your diagnosis. And, you know, it's like being a little pregnant, right? I mean, you are, you aren't. So if you've got a Lyme specific antibody, why don't people pay attention to that? And, you know, we call them Lyme specific, which means is that as far as we know, there's no other microbe that's cross reacting with this. And again, for someone who's used to do this test, false positive test with Lyme testing is extraordinarily rare. False negative is extremely common. So what often happens is you got the symptoms, you go to your doctor, get the test, test comes back negative, doctor says you don't have Lyme disease. And now you, the patient are left kind of holding the bag going, I still feel terrible. I don't know why, no one has answers. And you know, for Lyme patients to get glossed over in the diagnosis, this is just a hugely common problem, but it's really just a lack of education. And unfortunately, the infectious disease doctors who are supposed to be the experts of this, they've taken a very hard line that, you know, if your test isn't CDC positive, you do not have Lyme disease. And if you do, you get 21 days of doxycycline. If you're not better, it's not Lyme disease. So I don't really, again, understand the rationale behind that, but it, it's just, it's not really logical. And again, when you look at the literature behind this, you know, we know that Lyme can become persistent. We've got multiple studies out of Johns Hopkins showing this. So, you know, the, the 14 to 21 days of antibiotics, you know, just isn't enough for a lot of people to completely get rid of the infection. That's right. It, then I'm, I'm hearing that you can, antibi antibiotics in the initial acute stage can work if your immune system is already firing on all cylinders. And it possibly might not work if that's compromised in any way, which you know, we never know what, what our current state of immunity is, really. It's hard yeah. to say. Well, and just even using my own personal case, again, you know, I mean, I got bit, I identified it right away. I mean, I wasn't one of these people that had it for months and months and didn't know. I treated it early. You know, had I gone through the treatment and not had all the stress and the life of, you know, starting a business, if I was just working a nine to five job somewhere, I very well would have been fine. I may never had another consequence since. But again, I think it was the perfect storm of I was immune compromised, wasn't taking care of myself, just the timing of everything. And again, I think a lot of people who end up with persistent or chronic Lyme disease, you know, there's some element of underlying diet lifestyle factor that, you know, hasn't been addressed. Perhaps there's immune deficiency. There may be a genetic component that we haven't identified yet. So we've got all these variables that we're trying to sort out. But I think for people who have healthy, robust immune systems, they get exposed to Lyme, they get treated, they, they get over it, and they never have a problem again. So there are those people out there as well. And I'm sure if I tested everybody in the United States, I would be shocked at how many people have a positive test that never had a single symptom because fortunately their immune system uh, was, again, adequate enough to deal with it at the time. And you know, this is where, again, you have to be careful with Lyme testing because a positive test doesn't mean you have Lyme disease. Again, all it shows that you've had exposure. And again, living in Connecticut for almost 20 years, I saw a lot of people that we would test routinely and they would have positive antibodies and they never had a single symptom. I'm like, well, you got exposed at some point, your immune system did its job. And because we're measuring the immune response, you know, not that you have Lyme disease, just your immune system did its job. And therefore, you know, that's great. That's what we want. So we always have to take a look at what we see on paper versus what's in front of us. And that's how we come to the conclusion that someone does or does not have Lyme disease. Sounds like another virus I've been hearing a little bit about recently. Mm. Uh, you know, it's so funny. It's like this parallel between COVID-19 and Lyme is so scary. And all the issues that are coming up with COVID-19 with testing, what does the results mean? You know, all of us in the Lyme world are just kind of sitting back in our chairs. I'm like, well, duh, you know, welcome to our world. You know, we've only been dealing with this for the last 40 years. You've been dealing with it for nine months. But there is that, that you know, and I'm kind of hoping with everything going on with COVID-19 that that will be some level of awareness of what the Lyme community has been struggling with and that trying to get good testing, reliable results, getting adequate treatment, and you know what's been going on with COVID-19 has been very, very similar. So 
fingers crossed, you know, maybe some public health officials are paying attention to all this and start, uh, once we get through the pandemic, you know, we'll kind of refocus on what's happening with Lyme disease and we'll get better testing, better treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let's go back to testing a bit. In your book, you list several different types of testing for Lyme disease. Um, you don't mention I, the Igenix test. And I was just... Oh, I do. Oh, you do? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I didn't see it in there. Okay, good. So could you rank them for me, just roughly, just saying what your preference in tests would be to start for some people? Well, first and foremost, I'd say if you're suspicious about having Lyme, you know, probably don't go through your regular reference lab. Only in that the way they are interpreting the results, it misses a lot of people. So we prefer to use labs that specialize in tick-borne illness. So the two labs I tend to use most of is I use medical diagnostic labs in Hamilton, New Jersey, and I use IgenX from Palo Alto, California. They are both good labs. They have reliable testing. Uh, the biggest difference is MDL bills most people's insurance. So people like that because it's one more, you know, out-of-pocket expense they don't have to, you know, deal with. Mm -hmm. IgenX is cash unless you have Medicare. So for any non-Medicare person, you know, if you're doing a full tick-borne panel, it can run, you know, up to $1,500 to $2,000. So it just gets to be pretty expensive for people. But their quality of testing is excellent. So uh, I've, I, there are some things that IgenX does that MDL doesn't do. So I, a lot of my screening I will run through MDL just because, again, I think they do good testing. They're the only lab actually that sends me a copy of the Lyme Western blot. And again, being a microbiologist, I like to look at it myself so I can see the individual antibodies and the percentages. And there again, there's some things IgenX does that MDL doesn't offer. So then those secondary tests I'll, I'll use with IgenX. So again, they're both great labs. Uh, I also use Armin labs uh, that I don't think they're operating right now because the lab's in Germany. And I think they're having trouble shipping specimens from the US to Germany because of COVID-19. But their testing is a little bit different because it looks at cytokines. So cytokines are a different part of the immune system, but they don't involve antibodies. So if we have someone who maybe their exposure is so early that their immune system hasn't made antibodies yet, doing cytokine testing can be helpful. Or if you're just trying to determine if something's still active, cytokines can be active sometimes even when antibodies aren't. So it's a different way of looking at these organisms. And you can test for Lyme and Bartonella and Babesia and all the co-infections as well. So I think sometimes it's very helpful for people because, again, you can look at that actual immune activity, even if the antibody levels don't seem like they, they correlate with what you're seeing in front of you. So those are the, probably the three labs I use the most. I will use Galaxy Labs for Bartonella from time to time because they kind of specialize in Bartonella testing. Um, you know, again, the regular reference labs, if you happen to run it, it comes back positive, great. The likelihood of it being false positive is very low. Insurance pays for it. But... If you've gone through, you know, one of your local reference labs, your test comes back negative, it unfortunately may not exclude the possibility. So you probably want to work with someone who works with some of these other labs that specialize in tick-borne illness and run it through them and just double check and make sure, you know, you're, you're clear. And what about ELISA testing? Do these labs do that? Yeah, so ELISA testing is okay. the screening test that they do. Uh, I don't do a lot of ELISA testing just because the sensitivity of any lab that does ELISA testing is very low. When you look at the literature, it suggests that only about 43% of people with Lyme disease get picked up on the screening test. So any test that literally misses more than half the people that have the disease is a pretty terrible test. So I go straight to the Lyme Western blot. I skip the ELISA test. Again, even for me, when I had Lyme, and again, I had literally classic Lyme disease, my ELISA test was negative. And uh -huh. it may have been that maybe my antibody levels weren't high enough yet, but when I did my Western blot and I ran them at the same time, it lit up like a Christmas tree. I had every marker for Lyme, every Lyme-specific antibody. So I learned even for myself that the ELISA test isn't very helpful. And there are other types of methodologies used, particularly for uh, the co-infections. So, you know, there's, there's like Babesia has a fish test. Uh, which is a way of dyeing it with a fluorescent stain. You can look at it under a microscope. So that's a direct examination of, you know, Babesia. Bartonella has a Western blot test. So again, some of these co-infections do have more specific testing beyond the regular IgG and IgM ELISA testing that's available. But I'll do ELISA testing, again, as a screening for all the co-infections, uh, just because, again, often we will pick them up. And if we need more specific testing beyond that, there are generally other methodologies for the other co-infections as well. Right. Um, so I know a lot of people that have um, 
reached out to me with the ringing in their ears, which I know can be a sign or a symptom of Lyme disease. Uh, why would that be? And it, do you see it very often? Yeah, you know, tinnitus, uh, ringing of the ears is not an uncommon thing. Because Lyme causes a lot of neurological effects, again, it's that neural inflammation. And because the, the nerve that goes through your ear is one of your cranial nerves, you know, that nerve comes directly out of the brain. If that part of the brain happens to get affected, it can affect that, that ringing in the ear. So, you know, with, with tinnitus itself, you know, you have to go through the process of ruling out other possibilities. Uh, in my population, I wouldn't say it's super common. Maybe 20, 25% of people with Lyme will complain of the ringing in their ears. Uh, it's also very common with mold and mycotoxicity. And I find so many of my Lyme patients also have mycotoxicity. So it's always a good idea if you've got that ring in the ears to check for mycotoxicity as well as Lyme and some of these co-infections. Uh, there is a specific a antigen on certain molds that cross reacts with the inner part of your ear. So as your immune system reacts to the mold, it accidentally can damage the inner part of your ear and particularly that nerve. So again, it's a good idea to look at mold mycotoxicity if that's part of the problem as well. But you know, if it's Lyme related or co-infection, again, as we treat the infection, people usually tell me that the tendon starts to diminish. That's that's great. A lot of people. It's know. annoying. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it's really annoying. Uh, uh, let's discuss pH levels. Yeah. And why can coffee, corn, dairy, meats, and oats cause so much damage to us? I mean, I, and I have to say, I have to preface this with, there are so many people that don't understand the diet, body, Lyme connection. And, and in your book, you go into it in great detail and actually provide a lot of great healthy recipes at the end of the book. But Talk a little bit about, you know, corn, for instance, or dairy or meat. Why would that cause so much damage? Well, when we talk about pH, you know, if you look at the physiology of your body and particularly of your cells, you know, with the exception of your skin, your stomach, your bladder, and for women, the vaginal area, which are very acidic, this, this acidic to protect against outside invaders because most microbes don't survive in an acidic environment. So it's really a protective measurement to keep these things from getting further in the body. Outside of that, though, most of your cells and tissues function in an alkaline state. So any pH higher than seven. So anything that's acid is you know, one to seven, seven to 14 is alkaline or basic. So the more that we can keep your body in an alkaline state, the better chance we have for these cells to function the way they're supposed to. So that means enzymes function the way they're supposed to, tissue repair functions the way it's supposed to, you know, chemicals and hormones function the way they're supposed to. So for the same reason that you know you can't grow crops in acid rain, the acid is not conducive to the environment to allow you know produce to grow. Our body doesn't grow in an acid environment either. So when you eat certain foods or drink certain beverages, as the body digests them and breaks them down, they can either shift your cellular pH to be alkaline or acidic. And sometimes it's a little, and sometimes it's a lot. So you know as I started going through and looking at you know what was affecting people and started measuring urine pH. And again, we've got lots of studies showing that urine pH is a reliable way of kind of measuring how the body is reacting even internally, is that as we got people's pH, you know, in a more alkaline state, you know, they just felt better. You know, they were less reactive. Their healing process seemed to be, you know, going much faster. So, you know, there's been so many books written about alkaline diet over the year. I mean, this is nothing that I ever came up with. It's been around for decades. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the research out there, uh, you know, almost every study on it shows the positive benefits of eating this way. So I think if you go back to our true paleo forefathers, this is pretty much the way we ate. I think a lot of people say, well, I'm paleo and they eat like a ton of meat. Our paleo forefathers didn't eat a ton of meat just because they didn't kill every day. I mean, they could, but we basically foraged off the land. So it was still what you could pull out of the ground, pull off a vine, the tree. So it was still mostly plant-based, you know, foods with, you know, fairly minimal animal protein. So, you know, the diet that I recommend is, again, mostly plant-based because almost all vegetables, when you eat them, when they break down, make your body very alkaline. So it's not about the pH of the food. It's about how the food breaks down your body. So, for example, lemons and limes, if I squirt lemon juice on pH paper, it's very acidic. But when you ingest it as it breaks down, it actually makes your body very alkaline. So again, it's not about the pH of the food, it's about how the body breaks it down. 
And when you eat like, you know, animal proteins, most animal proteins tend to be slightly on the acidic side. Coffee is very acidic. I mean, the pH coffee is, you know, one. And, you know, unfortunately, when it breaks down, it makes your body very acidic. So when we talk about, you know, dairy products, corn, a lot of junk food, processed food, uh, coffee, even a lot of very sweet things, sometimes even like jam and honey. Again, by itself, it's down 10 more acidic. Ultimately, what we're really trying to do is trying to make the terrain conducive enough so it allows for the normal process of healing and tissue repair to occur, cellular repair to occur, so that everything's functioning the way it's designed to. And the other thing about this diet is that it's not really a diet. You know, it's not like a very restricted diet. And what I found is that it's sustainable. It becomes a lifestyle for people, where a lot of diets out there, keto diet, I think, can be good for some people. It's very, very hard for people to stick to a keto diet long term. Again, paleo diet just tends to be a diet where people eat more meat, more animal protein than they need. We now know from the research that people who consume a lot of animal protein are at higher risk of kidney disease because just breaking all that protein down can be hard in the kidneys. So I think in terms of you know feeding our right needs to keep them thriving, keeping our inflammation under control, you know, can be accomplished through you know an alkaline diet. And I, you know, when I talk with people one on one, I'm like I can't underscore, excuse me, the importance of you know how much diet and gut health impact your ability to get well. And if you're going to continue you know eating garbage, you know garbage in equals garbage out. And you know you will have a very hard time getting recovered if you continually to kind of abuse your body that way. So my first conversation before we even get into Lyman is get your gut situated, get your diet situated, because if we don't have that in working order, everything else is going to be harder to work well. Very true. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I was recently bit by a lone star tick. It was um, not on me for very long at all. And I sent it away for lab testing. It was all negative. So what would you recommend to a patient that already has Lyme disease and they, they you know, they get bit by a vector or, you know, another tick and, and everything basically says it's negative. Would you, would you say there's nothing really to worry about? Or are there other infectious bacteria that, that they would need to go on an antibiotic or some sort of protocol for? Yeah, you know, Lone Star ticks, uh, as far as we know, really don't transmit Lyme very much, Borrelia. However, you know, they can transmit a lot of these co-infections. We know that Ehrlichia, uh, anaplasma, rickettsia. There's another thing called starry, which is southern tick-associated rash illness. We call it Lyme light because you get this little rash. It's not the same bullseye rash you get with, uh, with Borrelia. We think it's another strain of Borrelia that causes this, but that's transmitted through uh, the, uh, the Lone Star ticks. So there are other infections you can get from a Lone Star tick that are independent of Lyme. So, you know, again, for someone who has a bite from a Lone Star tick, we treat it kind of the same as if we got bit by a deer tick. We may not be treating Lyme per se, but you could have acquired one of these other infections. So I still am in favor of sending the tick out and getting it tested. I will still test my patients to see if they have any evidence of exposure. And again, I will usually start treating, particularly if they know, like if you pulled the tick off yourself, you know it was on you, you know it's a lone star tick. You know, we'll usually start some sort of therapy until we get both uh, the tick results back and the individual patient's blood test results back to see if there's any evidence of exposure. And if they both come back negative and there's no clinical symptoms, fine, we'll stop treatment at that point. But you know, I've learned that I'd rather be safe than sorry. We know the earlier implement treatment, the better opportunity we have to get over it before it becomes a problem. Okay. Uh, I wanna talk a bit about the protocols that you list in your book, even though there are many, many different protocols out there. You list the Zhang, which I believe was the one you used in, uh, from the doctor in New York, the right. Cowden, the Byron White, the Stephen Berner, Buner, Buner, and the Beyond Balance. And I wanted to know if you have ever, I've been asked about the PK protocol. I believe that was a European protocol. Have you ever heard of that? Well, PK protocol is actually, it's Patricia Kane. Uh, Patricia Kane uh, is in New Jersey and she does a lot of research on fatty acids. So the PK protocol isn't the, a Lyme treatment per se. It's really a fat replacement protocol. So it utilizes things like phosphatidylcholine and glutathione. It's really if there are damaged you know, fats, and since these make up a lot of the lipid membranes of our cells, if those cells get damaged, you can replace it with these healthier fats to repair cells. So it's basically a cell repair program. 
And uh, again, I wouldn't think of it really as a Lyme treatment, but a lot of Lyme patients because they've had cell damage, they've got neuropathy, you know, if their nerve cells have been damaged, you know, the PK protocol can be a way to try and help basically replace those healthy fats to repair the cells. We use it in some patients, you know, we think need it. Uh, I don't use it in most of my patients, but yeah, it's, it stands for a Patricia Kane protocol. Thank you. And can you discuss herbs versus supplements? <laughs> I know it's a big question, but um, is there an opportunity to use both or are they doing different things? Help our listeners understand what the main difference is between those two. And if you prefer one over the other. I mean, often we're using both because they are doing different things. So, you know, herbs, you know, we're using often to treat Lyme itself. You know, a lot of these herbs actively kill Borrelia or any of the co-infections. But, you know, herbs are complex. And when you take an antibiotic, an antibiotic by and large is just killing the bug. When you take an herb, the herb may have a component that kills the bug, but it's got other components that might be anti-inflammatory, promote better circulation, help support your adrenals, help support your immune system. So you may get four, five, six actions from one herb. So with herbs, you know, we're often combining them in ways that we're not just targeting the organism, but we're helping address all these other things that Lyme or these co-infections do to the body. So, you know, that's the herb part. And then nutrients, I mean, we'll use, again, to address very specific issues. Like, you know, we know that Lyme can damage the mitochondria. So if someone has mitochondria damage, they're going to be tired all the time. They're going to feel very weak and have a poor stamina, maybe coordination problems. So maybe we're going to use CoQ10 and acetyl L-carnitine because we know these nutrients help feed the mitochondria and repair the mitochondrial damage. Or maybe we're going to use vitamin C because we want to help support the immune system or zinc for, you know, the immune system and tissue repair. So, you know, the nutrients really become very specific to the individual, depending on what other goals we need to accomplish in helping them get well. So combining herbs and supplements, you know, particularly vitamins and minerals is very common just because they are achieving different things in the body. And it's really just individual to the patient on which ones they need to help, you know, get their health goals. And I assume that obviously it, they should all be under a doctor's care. And also I assume that you reach those conclusions through a lot of blood work. In some cases, you know, some things are harder to measure like mitochondrial function can be harder to measure, but I can measure blood levels of CoQ10 and carnitine. And if someone's deficient, we can obviously give them to replenish that. So there are some things we can derive from blood work that gives guidance on where someone's depleted and they need to replenish that. You know, measuring, you know, vitamin and mineral levels in blood in some cases can be tricky because what's in blood doesn't necessarily represent what's in tissue. So there are other types of tests that may be a better representation of what's in tissue. Like if you do red blood cell mineral analysis, because red blood cells stay in your body for about three months, it's at least a closer approximation of what might be in tissue. But, you know, nobody does tissue biopsies, obviously very invasive and who wants to go through that? So we don't really know what the tissue levels are. So sometimes we're doing it based on blood work. Sometimes we're basing it just on clinical symptoms. And sometimes, honestly, we use nutrients as medication just because we know there's therapeutic value of giving higher doses of vitamin C or zinc or vitamin A or whatever the nutrient might be. Right. And do you administer IVs there at your practice or no? Yeah, we do. So again, you know, I try and get it as much orally as possible just because it's easier for people. Obviously, it's less expensive. You can do it at home. But for anyone who's got an absorption issue, they've got a gastrointestinal issue, or we need to give a level that we just can't possibly achieve orally, you know, then IV is a, a better way to administer it. So we do IVs in our practice for people we think really need it. Okay. And then discussing a pick line. So uh, there, there are some people that are advised to go on a long, long-term antibiotic program, such as like, you know, can be months up to a year or probably even beyond that I've seen. Yeah. Um, what are your general thoughts about the pick lines? I try to avoid pick lines only because pick lines, they need so much care. The risk of infection in the pick line, particularly when you're going to be on it for a long term, goes way up. For people who are really planning on being on long term, I think it's better to have a port put in it's just easier to administer. It doesn't require nearly the maintenance that a pick line does. You know, having a line literally hanging off your arm for however many months, it has to be constantly be flushed and clean. It's, it's just more difficult. Whereas with the port, you just need to flush the port every day. It's a lot easier. It's underneath the skin. 
and mm -hmm. you can administer all the you know necessary you know antibiotics or nutrients you need to the port. So uh, I think you know for people who know they're going to be in the long haul, the port is just a better option. What's the pro to going on long-term antibiotics like that through a port? Well, for me, it's sort of a hierarchy. You know, I mean, I always start with herbs unless it's it's overt neuro Lyme, you know, acute neuro Lyme. I mean, this is an indication where IV antibiotics are definitely the way to go. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't see a lot of acute neuro Lyme patients. Those people usually end up in the hospital. They end up at the neurologist. So by the time they get to me, usually they've had Lyme for quite a while. And again, when you look at the literature, the benefits of long-term antibiotics, when you've been really chronic, you know, the numbers just go down. The likelihood of it being successful goes down. The likelihood of having side effects goes up. So you always have to weigh the risk and the benefit. So I'm certainly not opposed to doing antibiotics, but for me, you know, if there's a way that we can do a less invasive intervention, be as successful clinically without the side effects, you know, that's a place to start. You know, if I've gone through, you know, various herbal protocols and people really aren't getting better, fine, at that point, I may try antibiotics and see if there's a difference. But, and, and I've had some patients where, you know, we've tried everything under the sun. They just, for whatever reason, really didn't respond. And then I've done different antibiotic protocols and they did respond. And you say, well, gosh, well, why didn't you just do that from the get-go? Well, my clinical experience in how treating now almost 7,000 Lyme patients is that you know the overwhelming majority of people I treat with herbs do very well. And again, I honestly, in 20 plus years of practice, I have probably written less than 12 prescriptions for antibiotics long-term. So it's just not something in my patient population that I really felt like I needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, again, these are people that we just got stuck on for whatever reason. And, uh, and very interestingly, more than half of those, in addition to having chronic Lyme, a lot of them had chronic yeast issues. And so we had put them on longer term antifungals. So was it the antifungal that helped more than the antibiotic? You know, who knows, because we use it in conjunction. But, you know, I've used uh, Dr. Fry's labs uh, for my cases where I really get stuck. Because again, he has the ability to look under a microscope and look at things that most labs don't look at. And I know in talking with him over the years, he finds a lot of these Lyme patients have this very unusual yeast in their blood when he looks. And so we've kind of targeted that. And in some cases, that seems to be the the mystery thing that we haven't been able to address. And what's interesting is that a lot of the common antifungals we use don't work very well against it. So we have to use a very specific antifungal with a very specific antibiotic to get people over the hump. And I've used that protocol a few times and it's been successful. So, wow, that's again, exciting. Yeah, so again, I'm not opposed to antibiotics, but again, if there's a way that we can help protect the gut, because we know that the gut is so important for the immune system. We know, if you look at the research on the microbiome, there's just I mean, literally thousands of articles a year coming out about the importance of maintaining your microbiome to have a healthy immune system. So if we want to give your immune system the best chance to fight Lyme or contraction on its own, you know, the antibiotics long term can and often do undermine that. The other thing is a lot of these antibiotics actually damage the mitochondria. So we know that Lyme can damage your mitochondria, the antibiotics damage the mitochondria. So if fatigue is your biggest issue, you know, you're going to have a very hard time getting that energy back if you're constantly beating up your mitochondria over and over. And even if we're giving, you know, nutrients to support the mitochondria, you know, it's kind of like filling up a bathtub and draining at the same time. You know, we just can't keep up with it. So, you know, because of the damage to the gut, because of the damage to the mitochondria, you know, I'm always more hesitant about long-term antibiotics because I know that I can't avoid that damage from happening. I can mitigate some of the effects. I can keep people from getting diarrhea, but I can't replace, you know, what's going to get torn away from the gut short of doing a fecal transplant, which isn't widely done in this country. And, you know, again, for me, it's, it's not at the, the first part of my list, it's really at the last part of my list. For those out there wondering, have you had success in killing 100% of Lyme bacteria, Lyme disease? I mean, is there ever a moment where a person can say, I am a thousand percent clear of this bacteria? Well, nobody knows. <laughs> Again, because we can't measure the organism directly, we have no way to measure how someone's clear or not clear. I can tell you I have a lot of patients that are 100% symptom-free. Are they cured? I, I suppose that's open for debate. You know, I, I did a post on social media last year, and I talked about Lyme being cured, and all the trolls came out and blasted me and said, you can't cure Lyme. I'm like, well, if I get chickenpox and the chickenpox goes away, 
that virus is still in your body. Now you can get shingles 50 years later, it's the same virus. Are you cured of chickenpox? Or, I mean, so I guess depending on how you're defining it, can we get people to a point where they live 100% symptom free? Yes, it is possible. And I have had numerous patients that are at that point. Is it difficult? Absolutely. And I think the longer you've been dealing with it, the harder it is to get back to that place. But it is possible. You know, it is built into our DNA to heal. And you know, we just have to clear the obstacles to heal. And where I have seen a lot of people not be as successful, no matter what active treatment they're doing, is again, when they're not taking care of all these other things I talk about in my book. Again, they're not eating well, they're not sleeping well, they have tons of stress, they're in a toxic environment, whether they're literally surrounded with chemical toxins or you know, maybe a toxic relationship. You know, all these kind of things do play a role in your health. And these things that constantly undermine you, again, the best of treatments may not be nearly as successful when all these other things haven't been addressed. So that's why we have to look at the mind, the body, the spirit, the whole person, when we're dealing with Lyme, because we want to get everything functioning at its optimal level, again, to give your body the best chance to heal. Is there anything out there right now that you're excited about? Well, one of the therapies we've been doing for quite a while now that has been really a game changer for a lot of people is what's called LDI or low dose immunotherapy. Dr. Ty Vinson in Kona, Hawaii is the guy that developed it. And if you guys go on YouTube, you can check out his videos. He's got a whole bunch of it. And I think a lot of people in the Lyme community at least have heard of it at this point. I think it's been around now for about six or seven years. And we, know we were there at the very beginning with Dr. Vinson doing this therapy. And the whole concept behind it is, you know, if your immune system starts treating Lyme or any of these infections like an allergen instead of a pathogen, it engages a different part of the immune system. So ultimately what we're trying to do is retrain the immune system to stop reacting to this organism. So it doesn't interfere with your innate ability to fight the infection. It's really just a way of turning off that autoimmune reaction. And I think for a lot of people with chronic Lyme, this is what's precipitating a lot of the symptoms. And again, I've had people that have had, you know, terrible joint pain and neuropathy and headaches. And you know, we it'll utilize this therapy. And within 24, 48 hours of giving them their dose, these symptoms go away. Now, often we have to do repeated doses over the course of time to keep symptoms from coming back. But uh, for some people, it's really been a game changer. So, you know, that's been one of the more relatively new things that, that we've done in the practice that, again, for some people's had tremendous impact. So it's something, you know, particularly after people have been on, you know, any kind of antimicrobial therapy for a while, you know, maybe worth considering because I think in terms of safety, efficacy, you know, the, the benefits definitely outweigh the risk. You will read about some people who do this therapy, and if they get a dose that is too strong, will definitely flare. Uh, mm -hmm. It sucks. However, it's also proving that that's what's causing your symptom. So there is a little bit of a diagnostic aspect of this therapy that if I give a dose of, you know, a Lyme antigen, and basically these antigens are dead organism, you know, they've been irradiated, they can't reproduce, they can't cause disease, but they maintain all the little proteins that we need to help shape the immune system. And we mix with an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. And the beta-glucuronidase tends to help modulate whatever, whatever you mix it with. So we've got antigens for Lyme and you know, Bartonella and Babesia and so forth. Wow, that's so, incredible. Are they, so, are they injections? No, these are administered under the tongue. So it's just a, you know, one or two drops under the tongue. And you know, once you find the target dose, you get a dose every seven weeks. So it's not something you're doing every single day. And again, our challenge when we start this therapy is we're just trying to find out what is the right antigen, what is the right dose. So I've done this therapy for myself. And when I was you know, first starting, I tried the Lyme antigen. Now at this point, I'd been treated for Lyme many years prior and it didn't really do anything for me, but I did the Candida antigen and my brain fog literally within 24 hours cleared up. So Unbelievable. With, I think with all the antimicrobial therapy I did, even though I was taking probiotics, I think it did dispose me to yeast. And even though I never felt like I was having a yeast infection, I think the yeast was interfering with my, my cognitive function. And boy, after I did it, my, my clarity, you know, I used to stumble on words and, and all that kind of cleared up. So, you know, the antigen that you might need may not necessarily think what it is. So often we are cycling through various antigens based on what we find on lab testing, whether it's blood tests, stool testing, urine testing, based on your history of, you know, previous in infections. Uh, I had one kid uh, who came into my practice who we thought had strep and he had a lot of classic symptoms of strep and I did a blood test. The strep was uh, tighter was sky high 
and I gave him the strep LDI and nothing really happened. I gave him a couple of different doses and nothing changed. And the mom says, well, he did have Lyme disease four or five years ago. And I said, well, let's try the Lyme antigen. And I gave him the Lyme antigen within 24 hours, all his symptoms completely went away. So I think what happened is that he had this underlying Lyme. The strep was the catalyst to uh, like get the Lyme stirred up again. And even though on the surface it seemed like strep was the problem, it really was the Lyme. So, you know, we, we have this process we have to go through to find out what the right antigen is, what the right dose is. So it requires a little bit of patience on both our, our point to try and really figure out, you know, what the right antigen, right dose is. But once we do, you know, once people take their dose, usually within 24, 48 hours, we see some kind of change. And I think there's very few therapies in the Lyme world that we see that kind of change quickly. Oh, that's so exciting. I love that. Thank you for sharing. And I love your chapter on what to do specifically if you're not getting better, if you hit a stumbling block on your, uh, on your journey. And, and our, read, our readers and listeners can go to, go to your book and, and you actually list all the different types of tests that you can take to your doctor if your doctor is not being as proactive as you would like them to be. And I also, again, I love the recipes at the end of your book and your list of resources on just about everything under the sun. So I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for coming here and, and sharing a bit of your wisdom with us. We could sit here all day long, um, but I'll let you get on with your Labor Day weekend festivities and um, I just want to tell our listeners there that again Dr. Engel's book is called The Lyme Solution. It's on my website. I'm sure it's on his website. It's everywhere you can find books and you also have a great website Dr. Engel's and it is at Darren Engel's N as in Nancy D dot com and you're also on Instagram at Darren Engel's N D. So thank you so much again. I hope you'll come back and maybe even do a live or just come back and we can go into one of these topics more in depth. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Allie. And yeah, I'd love to do a Facebook Live where we can interact with you guys and answer your questions because I know you're like, I'm a Lyme patient too. I know what it's like. And there's so many things that come up and you may or may not be getting answers from your doctor or your other practitioner. So I'd love to jump on with you guys and uh, you know, help answer some of those questions. Sounds great. Thanks again. All right. See thanks again. Allie.